All right, all right, all right. Welcome all you gophers to another session here at GoLab 2020. Uh, my name's Latara. I'll be the talk manager managing some uh, Q&A things at the end. So we're just about to read a short by um, just about to watch a short talk called Open Telemetry in Practice by Ilya Kaznichev. And uh, we'll go ahead and bring him on so he can say hi to everyone. So let's bring him live. Hi to everyone. Hello, Ilya. Great to have Hello. you here. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Welcome to GoLab. Thank you. For nice sure. To, nice to share this platform with all of you. Yeah, you know, even if it's virtual this year, we're happy to have you. <laughs> For sure. So everyone, in case you don't know, let me read to you a little bit about Ilya here. He is a remote back-end back software engineer who is passionate about Go, Cloud, and DevOps. He is an active speaker and community leader, founder of Golang Varonish, an SAP community Varonish, uh, organizer of conferences and meetups, and host of Z Namespace podcast. So in this talk, he will help you dig into the use of open telemetry for trailing and monitoring in Go projects. There are already a lot of speeches in explaining the theory, so he will help us concentrate on the practice of it. The purpose of the presentation is that a person who is already familiar with the concept of tracing and monitoring and probably has experience with open tracing or open census can come to work the next day and organize the transition to open telemetry or at least get an understanding of how to use it. The release version is scheduled for the second half of 2020, and it is possible that it will already take place at the time of the conference. Now it is version 0.8 for Go. Uh, but even if not, the library is already working. The main functionality is already there. Thus, the experience of practical use will be useful to everyone who has non-proprietary tracing and monitoring on their projects now, because open tracing and open census are stopping support in favor of open telemetry. So uh, before we get started with the video, did you have anything you wanted to add? Any updates? Nothing special. Uh, I, just, I hope that will be interesting because um, the library uh, we will meet the major release soon. It's planned for November, so probably um, you can start actively using it uh, this year before the new year. And um, hopefully this information um, will help you to do it with ease and without so much questions and pain. So. Thank you Let's for see. that. Yeah, sure. definitely. Thank you. All right, everyone, uh, sit back, enjoy the talk, and stay tuned until the end. We'll have a live Q&A with Ilya. Uh, I just want to give everyone a gentle reminder to use the Q&A chat with the question mark on it uh, to ask any questions that you may have. So thanks, and we'll see you afterwards. Hello. Distributed system development is a complex task. To understand how it works is even more difficult, especially when your services run in the cloud, where you have no direct or easy access. There is where telemetry comes to help. And even though it's also a pretty confusing topic, there are open standards that make it easier to apply, both on the application and the infrastructure side. One such standard will be discussed today – OpenTelemetry. My name is Ilya Kaznachev, and I work as a remote developer and tech lead at CloudMTS, which is a cloud platform where you can run your Kubernetes clusters and so on. 
I'm also a founder of several local communities, host of a podcast and organizer of some local conferences and meetups. Also, I really like coffee. So if you're not interested in all of this microservice hype, we can talk about that later. So let's talk about open telemetry. The standard uh, appeared last year but has already been widely distribu distributed and supported by many tracing and monitoring software vendors. But what telemetry is? Let's start with observability. In control theory, observability is a measure of how the internal state of the system can be obtained from its external outputs. In software development, that means a set of approaches to watch the system in a runtime. time. There are three pillars of observability – logging, tracing and monitoring. We will not talk about logging today, so let's take a closer look at tracing and monitoring. There are many, many vendor solutions for tracing and monitoring, but there are also two open standards – Open Tracing by CNCF and Open Census by Google. There are two nice standards that competed for some time until in 2019 they decided to merge into a single new standard called OpenTelemetry. At the time of the conference, the Go library is in beta version. The first major release is scheduled for November. Uh, it is expected that by the end of the year, the library and other components will reach a production readiness state. The standard assumes uh, wide possibilities of combining everything with everything and it is in fact an active layer between the producers of metric and traces and their consumers. Let's have a look at some use cases. To perform distributed tracing, you can configure a direct connection to Jaeger or a tracing tool um, you are using. If you are pushing your traces directly, you can just replace the library and leave the same configuration or quite the same. To collect metrics, you can also configure Prometheus direct access to the metrics port of your application. This may be useful if uh, you have a simple infrastructure and you collect your metrics directly. But the standard also provides more flexible options. The basic scenario is to collect metrics and tracing using OpenTelemetry Collector, running as an application or a container in your infrastructure. All you need uh, is to set up uh, an OTLP exporter in your service, which will communicate with the collector. On the collector side, you can customize the format and parameters for exporting data to the tools like Jaeger or Prometheus, or to other formats such as Open Census. The collector allows you to connect many types of data sources as, as receivers and many data consumers as exporters. So the open telemetry provides compatibility with a large number of open and vendor standards. The standard is extensible, so there are many different vendor receivers and export exporters already. So you can run open telemetry even you, if you are using proprietary software for metrics or traces, solving the problem with vendor log. I don't give here examples of an app configuration code uh, because of two reasons. First, it will simply not fit on the slides. And secondly, uh, it is already well described in the library examples. So you can just open them and uh, copy and paste that code. The links will be at the end. The collector is easy to configure via the YAML configuration file. Here are receivers, the data sources, and exporters, the data consumers. Processors are data processing methods inside the collector. 
and finally pipelines which determine how each data stream will be processed. Let's see how it works by example. Let's say you have a microservice instrumented with OpenTelemetry. Say you have another one with the same setup. Easy so far. But suddenly you have some legacy services that work via OpenSensus. And there is a database which also provides data in its own format. For example, directly to the Prometheus like Postgres with uh, Postgres uh, metrics. And um, another one works in a container that also gives metrics in some format and you just using uh, this container. So you don't want to rebuild it or add some sidecars to just change the format of these metrics. And the last one, as an example, uh, is some hardware with some metrics too. So it's maybe hard to believe, but you can just combine it with a single collector. Most applications mm, that you will use produce the data in a format compatible with OpenTelemetry. Okay. Now we want to use this information somehow. For the traces, we can use Jaeger. And for metrics, we can use Prometheus, just for, for example. But what if we want to move to AWS and use their built-in tracer? No problem. You can just run it through the open sensors, which is supported out of the box. Well, the theory is over, let's talk about how to use tracing in practice. At the beginning, you need to create a root span, which serves as the root for the call tree. Here you can specify the name of your service or a library. In the tracer, you will see uh, if a specific span is uh, related to your application or to the imported library. Next, a root span is created with some name. Choose the name that will clearly describe the trace level. For example, it can be a method name or an architecture level name. Span data is also placed in context, so the context must be propagated to the methods you want to trace. Span is a process at a certain level of a call tree, where you can put attributes, logs and error status. It is mandatory to close the span at the end to calculate its duration and so on. Do it in the same method where you're creating it. This is what span looks like in Jaeger. You can expand it and re review the logs and attributes. Then you can get the same trace from the context if you don't want to create the new one. For example, if you want to trace several methods of a single architecture layer, or layer within one span. Note that you don't need to close it here because it will be closed in the method where it was created. So you are just reading the span here, the same span. And here we write a message in the same root span. And mm, here is the message. Now we want to create a separate child span inherited from the context. Here we get a global tracer by the library name. This call can be wrapped in some method or uh, you can use just a global variable because it will be the same all the time inside of your service. Next, we create a child span from the context and please don't forget that the span should be closed in, at the end of the method. This message should appear in the child span. And here it is. You can see that the span hierarchy uh, that um, the span hierarchy by the call stack looks like that. So the longer root span because it uh, begins earlier and uh, then it takes some time to finish. So that's why the child span normally is shorter. 
You can write attributes in the span. They are tags in terms of Jaeger. Here is our request ID attribute. You can add events, aka logs. Logs can contain labels, about the same as a structure logs like logos. Here you here's your message in the span log. And more detailed uh, view with labels. In case of an error, you can set an error status. Then it will be marked as an error in the span. Available codes are OK, error and unset. OK will be set uh, by default, but in case of error, you have to set error status manually. Here you can see that the trace with an error is marked with the red icon. Here's our error code and the error message. So it's all right, but tracing it's not a substitute for logs. The main point is to track the flow of information through a distributed system and to achieve uh, this we need to put traces into network calls and be able to read them from there. There are many third-party middleware and interceptors for different frameworks and libraries in OpenTelemetry. On the left is a list of popular frameworks for which middlewares and interceptors are available. There are also a standard uh, HTTP uh, middleware, JPC, Sarama Kafka, and others. Let's see how to use this by an example of a standard HTTP server. On the client side, we simply add an interceptor as a transport and uh, requests are enhanced with traced ID, trace ID and all uh, information needed to continue the trace uh, on the server side. On the server side, a small middleware is added with the name of the library. Next, as usual, you get span from the context, create child spans, use them, close them, at the end, and so on. This is what a simple request through three services looks like. The hierarchy of spans in the process of request execution, uh, with the duration of each span. It's also possible to expand any span and see the details. And here's how the error looks. It's easy to track immediately where it happened, when, how much time uh, has passed, and so on. In the span, you can also see detailed information about uh, context in which the error occurred. Uh, you also can add span labels at uh, the span creation, so you don't have to copy uh, and paste them for each error handling. Those labels like request ID, some key fields of database table and so on. So you probably want to know them at the point of error because they are related to the error and it's just simpler to set them just at the span creation. And here's some extra. How to make middleware from the method uh, from this method to use it as a global middleware with libraries like Gorilla Ichi. It's easy like that and you also can add to the new handler method some um, helpful options. It's up to you. Give it a try. Now it's time to talk about monitoring. Connection to the monitor, monitoring system is set up in the same way as for tracing. I will not show the code here, so see the examples in the library. There is no rocket science, just copy and paste and change ports, etc. Measurements are divided into two types. Synchronous uh, instruments are called by the user while asynchronous instruments are called by the SDK during collection. The instruments may be additive and monolithic, in which case there are non-decreasing sum and naturally define something like a rate. 
they can be additive but not mon mon monotonic sorry and uh, semantically intended for capturing a sum of a positive or negative numbers and non-additive at all uh, which are mm, intended for capturing a distribution and will record numbers as a sequence instead of a sum. All instruments support float and integer uh, input values. At the beginning of the program, a global meter is also created with the same name of the library or, or service, just like in the case of the global tracer. Next, an instrument is created. Uh, there is a metric name, description, and a set of labels to filter with, if you need them. At the end of the program, you should call and bind for each instrument to free resources, etc. Writing them is also easy. Positive numbers for counters, which will be aggregated. Any numbers for up-down counters, which also will be aggregated and also any numbers for value recorder which will form a sequence of these numbers or kind of distribution and here what we get at the output our matrix with a comment and a given label so last thing i would like to say is that the standard provides an opportunity to instrument the libraries Previously, when you used Open Census or Open Tracing or some vendor libraries, you could not instrument libraries, especially open source, because I, otherwise you got a vendor lock. Those who have been working with tracing must have noticed that last large client libraries, like some databases or maybe some huge APIs. Uh, sometimes fall with unclear errors uh, where tracing would be very helpful to debug or determine these errors in productive system. So open telemetry solves this problem. Since the standard SDK and API are separate, the trace API and metrics can be used independently of the SDK and specific data export settings. The library will take everything it needs from the provided context. What's more, you can instrument your methods first and only then configure your data exporters, if needed. This way, you can instrument the library without having to worry about how and where the data will be exported from the app. This is suitable for both private and open source libraries. There is, no need, uh, there is no need to worry about vendor log and uh, no need to worry about how this information will be used or whether, it'll be, uh, whether it will be used at all. Libraries are instrumented, the application is also instrumented and the data export configuration is specified when it's initializing the application. In this case, you specify the exporter settings, specify the global tracer and matter, and then all the necessary information gets into context. Next, each subsequent application layer, like method, uses the open, open tracing API uh, and context data you provided to perform traces and measurements. So it is isolated from the specific SDK and uh, exporter settings. Uh, imported libraries will simply inherit their, their span from the span uh, at the level of which the library uh, was called, and so on. This way, you can instrument your libraries and applications first, and only then configure the data export when you need it. So you can first instrument your library, write the library, write tracings, write metrics if you need so, uh, then import the library as a package in Go, uh, call the methods with context. This context will provide your own instrumentation 
and you can deploy that into production system. And then some time later, you may want to start doing tr tracing and monitoring and then deploying uh, open telemetry collector, some tracers, some uh, metric databases and uh, set up the exporter in your service. And all of this will work. And so we came to the end. In general, OpenTelemetry standard is very promising. It is not yet fully uh, ready for production, so I suggest you to wait until release before using it um, in a productive system. But you can already explore it, explore and try it. Here are a few links. A video with a standard overview, the Golang library with SDK, API and those examples, a third-party plugins, middlewares and interceptors, and open telemetry collector documentation. So that's all I have for today. Thank you for your attention and have a good instrumenting. All right, welcome back everyone. We are ready now to go live with Ilya to answer any questions that you have. So let's bring him on. Ilya, yes, we are coming. There you are, hello. hello <laughs> Good to again. see you again. Yes, um, first of all, again, thank you so much for that presentation. We're happy you could be part of GoLab even if virtually this year. <laughs> Uh, was there anything else from the video that you wanted to add after watching it again? Mm, I would say that uh, I just want I just want to add that currently the library is changing because of some uh, backward incompatible updates in uh, minor versions. So that would make sense to wait until. Uh, the release in November and I hope it will be in November because I really want to implement that in my current project because now we have some kind of, you know, not really nice and mm, very well composed metrics and tracing. And also, yeah, I think that is so waiting for November and hopefully it will be ready and we can implement that without fear of any incompatible changes in the API. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed for that. <laughs> yep. Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, we love the see seeing the gophers behind you as well. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> uh, yep. Speaking of that, do you have anything you would like to say about your participation in GoLab this year? Oh. I like that um, I'm now a part of this conference. It's a really amazing event. And that's cool that I can participate, participate remotely because, you know, it's difficult to schedule any events offline these times. So I hope in future there will be an opportunities to participate some events like that also online because it's just very nice to do that because you know you can save some time in traveling and so on and just sharing your knowledge from your home that's kind of cool yeah At yeah least to me. Yeah, there are definitely pros and cons to having live conferences. And one of the advantages is, yeah, you don't have to travel. You can do it in your pajamas. <laughs> Nobody will know. <laughs> yep. For sure, for sure. All right. Well, how about we proceed with the questions? We have a couple here from Vasil. I'm sorry, Vasile. Uh, and his first question was, what would be 
the what would happen if span is not closed? Would it cause some performance issues? Mm -hmm. uh, I can't answer about performance issues because it depends on span implementation. So there are a couple of different uh, span types now, depending of your settings and so on. But the main thing that the end of span function does that it uh, mm, it measures the uh, duration of the span. So if you are seeing this line or this line uh, in the tracer, like Jaeger, uh, this is the this is the duration of the span or the span lifetime. So when you call the end function, it will stop uh, the timer, and uh, this final duration will be represented in the mm, tracer. And also mm, looking at current implementation, it also will handle panic. And so if you defer in the end uh, function and uh, the, fu the function will cause panic, this panic will be written into the span. Uh, it will not be stopped, but uh, this information will be in the span attributes or span logs. So you can use that to determine to determine what happened with my code in you don't know cloud system or and so on. That's also really helpful and uh, something like that. So I don't think that it will break something if you will not end the span. I haven't tried that because you know that is something illegal from the terms of uh, um, tracing, but it will not break anything. But probably you will either lost your timing or it will be not correct. So maybe it will be finished uh, at the end of the. Uh, I don't know where exactly, probably when the application will be shut down, but um, that is definitely not what you want to have. So just don't forget to defer the span and function each time where you're creating it and you will be okay. All right, thank you for that good explanation. Uh, we have another question by him as well which says, um, if I use HTTP middleware for traces and I get a 404 response, would it be with error? Can I manually set this for request for 404 to not write as error this span? I would like to exactly call mm -hmm. this, this call to be a success. It is related to business logic. Mm, that's interesting question because uh, for now, as uh, well as I know, mm, the standard middleware will mark the mm, non twenty error codes, uh, twenty response codes as errors. So probably you will have to define your own middleware and just copy something and do that. I'm not sure if it's possible to do that with some kind of uh, settings. I think rather no than yes. So the easiest way to do to achieve that uh, is just to add your own middleware, and that's pretty easy to to achieve. But maybe there will be something like defining a range of errors to a range of codes to just not mark them as an error, and that's probably a great um, topic to feature request. Sure, yeah, maybe for our next edition. Maybe. Uh, let's see, we have another question here by Ilan who says, what is a good way to pass span between services of different languages? For example, from Go to Java, to a CLI app running in a container, to another Go service, to a, bad, a database, et cetera, in one span. Mm -hmm. So normally the span is uh, the tracing and spans are uh, language agnostic. So probably each language and not probably definitely many of languages like Java, Python, Go and so on and so forth already have their own libraries and they use their uh, the same APIs, the same way to inject the trace ID into the requests. So you can just use 
that uh, libraries to instrument your requests and your um, HTTP requests and on the server side, the handlers, and it will be done automatically for you. So it will be hide uh, under the abstraction layer. So for example, I can instrument the Go, uh, the Go server with uh, Golang library and another microservice, let's say, can be instrumented with Python library because it's written in Python and it will just works because the Go knows how to get that, uh, how to extract the tracing API, the trace, the trace ID from the request and how to inject that into the next uh, request. And the Python, uh, Python library, does the same, so it just extracts the um, tracing uh, the, the trace ID and use that to continue the trace with new spans. So just do that. If you are using language that uh, is um, that doesn't have uh, open telemetry library yet, like some rare language, I don't know. Uh, so you probably can implement the same by your own. It probably will take some time to you, but um, the standard of open telemetry is language agnostic. It's just a standard of um, a set of structures and methods that could be implemented in any language. So that's not that should not be a problem for you. Okay, thank you. And we have just um, a little bit Kind of in addition to that, a comment. Um, Vasile says, yes, you can use open census in different applications. I use traces for services in Go, Java, and DB. And in the log traces, I see all three services in different languages. So yeah, you can do the same with open telemetry. And also open telemetry is compatible with open census. So if you have some services already instrumented with open census, you can just use them as is. You don't have to um, rewrite everything to use with open telemetry. Probably it would be better, but you can just leave it as is and uh, use open census uh, ex exporter in open in open telemetry collector and it will do all the work for you so that's simple okay great thank you um i think that might have been the last question uh of the day i don't see any more else yeah okay great well in that case uh we'll go ahead and oh sorry just one more thing uh some great uh, resource here uh supported languages Go, Java, C Sharp, C++, Node.js, Ruby, Elixir, Python, and PHP. You can see that all on opencensus.io slash language support in case anyone watching isn't watching the chat. So thank you for that. All right. Well, I guess that means we could wrap it up in case there was anything else you would like to add. I think that's all. Thank you for your attention and hopefully it will help you to monitor and observe your applications in cloud and uh, reduce some pain in production systems. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants watching and of course to our speaker. We hope to see you also in the next edition of GoLab, virtual or not, we hope you can make it. Thank you. Thanks and see you around. See you, bye. <laughs> bye bye. Okay, everyone. So if you enjoyed this chat, you can definitely rate it on the agenda page. Giving feedback always helps. I hope you all know that. <laughs> so we'll be waiting for you for the next talk of the day, which will be uh, tests in a box, shipping your tests in a container for fun and for profit at 3.40 p.m. So that's in 30 minutes if you don't want to do the calculations, just in 30 minutes. So I uh, hope to see you there and hope to hope you enjoy the rest of GoLab. Thanks. <laughs>